Thank you. I want to start by thanking Rachel and the Freshwater Lab and the Chicago Humanities Festival for the opportunity to talk today about the subject of aquatic invasive species, and more specifically to talk about the rivers, waterways, bodies of water that these invasive species like carp inhabit, um, and about the historical relationship with these rivers and how our understanding of the problem, how, how our historical relationship with these rivers constrains our conception of the problem and our idea of what solutions could be. Uh, I've been working on the question of invasive species and the Chicago area waterway system for about 10 years. And in that time, I have so appreciated my conversations with Rachel and the Freshwater Lab team. In them, I've found a willingness to look beyond the idea of the problem of a couple species of fish moving through the water and think about the far-reaching implications and how invasive species, Asian, uh, invasive carp, are really a function of more widespread systemic problems. I want to delve into that story a little bit today. I think it's a fascinating one. Um, I was hired, the first thing I was hired to do with Prairie Rivers Network was to advocate for a solution to the transfer of aquatic invasive species between the Great Lakes and the Mississippi River watersheds. Um, at the time, and still today, that focus is largely on carp. But there's more to the story, and I'll, I'll get to that in a minute. Um, I'll go briefly into the history, because it's important to understand how we got where we are. So, once upon a time, really up until about 1900, the Chicago River and the Calumet Rivers flowed into Lake Michigan. Many of you may be familiar with the story. But right around 1900, the rivers were reversed, and a concrete canal was built to connect the Chicago River and the Calumet Rivers to the Des Plaines River. And so a connection was made between the Great Lakes and the Mississippi River watershed for the first time in thousands of years. This was done for a couple reasons, but the two big ones are that, at the time, Chicago was a, a growing city. <laughs> Uh, and there was very little water treatment. Chicago was sending, putting its waste directly into the Chicago River, which was then flowing into its water source, Lake Michigan. So what they did was reverse the river and send that waste downstream and make it someone else's problem. That was the primary reason, and it was successful. It, you know, it, putting, direct, putting raw sewage in the lake led to illness, death, it was successful in the sense that they did make that problem someone else's. The second reason is that much of the wealth that was extracted in the West at that time was being routed to Chicago. And this connection allowed commerce to move between the West and the, eastern, the population centers of the Eastern Seaboard through the hub of Chicago. So the dual purposes are right there in the name. Chicago Sanitary and ship canal. Now, there are many consequences of this connection, and one that people didn't really start thinking about until relatively recently was that this allowed invasive species to move between these historically disconnected watersheds. Um, there's a whole other presentation about how invasive carp got here, but the short story is that they were imported in the middle of the 20th century to help clean up aquaculture ponds, aquaculture farms in the South and Midwest, they're voracious filter feeders, and so the idea is that they could filter the muck and algae that accrues quickly when you have a lot, when you're farming a lot of fish in a small area. One way or another, they got out, they got into the Mississippi River, and from the Mississippi, they've made their way into most of the larger and smaller rivers connected to the Mississippi. In the 90s, give or take a few years, there really was a dawning awareness that this may be a problem. This may be a problem for the Great Lakes because of this connection here. So, um, in 2002, an electric barrier was installed in the waterway around Lockport. Actually, this barrier was put in to stop a different invasive species, but it was completed too late. So the round goby got through. It has since basically become the carpet barrier. This is the only uh, means of structural deterrence that we have from keeping carp and other swimming species from coming into the Great Lakes. Um, now, 
even after the, the electric barrier was completed, a lot of stakeholders who wanted to keep carp out of the Great Lakes didn't think these barriers provided enough protection. So over the last couple of decades, there's been a lot of interest in finding more permanent solutions to keep carp out of the Great Lakes. Ten years ago or so, one of those solutions under discussion was severing the connection. So cutting off that, cutting, you know, damming up the canal, basically. As some called it, restoring the natural divide. I was hired to advocate for that solution. Now, there were years of negotiations between various stakeholders, environmental groups, the city of Chicago, who still relies on this waterway to send its waste downstream, MWRD, who's in charge of that part of the waterway, shipping interests and the various interests that ship their products on the waterways, chemicals, petroleum, ag, construction. It became very clear that separating the basins was going to be very expensive, 18 billion, 25 billion, and it faced considerable headwinds, political headwinds, primarily from those stakeholder groups who have benefited from the canal system for the past 120 years. The city of Chicago, which continues to use the canal to send its waste downstream, and the shipping industry. And when I say the shipping industry, I want you to think about, again, all of those commodities that use the shipping industry, ag, petrochemicals. So the Army Corps studied this problem, came up with various alternatives, shy of re-separating the basins. And it, there was a plan that was settled on. Uh, to, in, to install deterrent technologies at the Brandon Road Lock and Dam, to basically reinforce the Lock and Dam at Brandon Road in Joliet, Illinois. This is the Brandon Road Lock and Dam. So on the left side, kind of the lower left, you've got a high head dam. That's about 30 feet drop. This is the Des Plaines River right here. So about a 30 foot drop running downstream. Up at the top, you can see the lock channel. So ships going up and down the Des Plaines have to move through that lock. Here's another view. Here's the lock chamber. You can see at the top, the dam. So what they're going to do is install a suite of technologies here in the lock. They will um, extend the lock chamber, or extend the channel that leads into the lock. They're going to install, they're planning at least, they're currently in the design phase, they're planning to install um, a bubble curtain, noise generators to repel fish, and then they'll put a new electric barrier in the, uh, in the run up to the lock chamber and then create a flushing system, the lock, to, to basically flush water out. So the idea is anything coming upstream, any ship that goes upstream has to go through the lock, so, so too of any fish. You know, they're not going to make it up the 30 foot. They can jump, but they can't jump 30 feet. So they have to go through the lock. So the idea is let's keep them, let's use this as the choke point. It's going to cost upwards of $800 million, probably take about a decade to complete. Now, I want to do a quick sidebar here. Carp aren't the only invasive species. <laughs> Um, in fact, there are many, many more invasive species currently in the Great Lakes moving their way into the Mississippi River system. These, this list of species was come up by the Army Corps when they were studying it. As you can see, there's far more. And in fact, according to the Corps, there are species that pose a higher risk of both economic and ecological um, impact threatening to move from the Great Lakes into the Mississippi River. They actually listed carp as posing a medium risk. There was another option identified by the Army Corps of Engineers, and that was, I'll back up real quick, that was just close the lock. If the lock's closed, nothing can go upstream. No ships are going upstream, no fish are going upstream. This option essentially brings the risk of carp getting into the Great Lakes to zero. It's, experts have weighed in on how much risk reduction the Brandon Road project will, will provide, and it's unclear. We know electric barriers are permeable to um, schools of fish moving through them, to small fish moving through them. 
into being pulled through in the wake of barges. And actually, they're going to turn the electric barrier off. The electric barrier is probably the primary. You get the greatest risk reduction from the barrier, but they're going to turn that off when the ships go through. So there was another option, close the lock. Rather than 800 million, this cost 6 million. It wouldn't take 10 years, you could do it tomorrow. That option was rejected immediately. The environmental organizations and advocacy groups who just a year or two prior had been calling for a $25 billion project to completely separate the basins didn't even press the issue. Marching orders had come in, the technological option to reinforce the checkpoint at Brandon Road was, the, was, the, uh, was the, the plan that would move forward. And this is the point where I'd like to ask, how much time have I got? I'd like to ask why. Why these fish and not the other fish? Why the solution at Brandon? Why this solution? Let's, let's point out again, this is the Des Plaines River. This is not the canal. This is a natural river system. So why are we building the quote unquote solution at a place that's not exactly the problem? And I'm going to use my last couple minutes to unpack those questions. What are rivers for? All right, I love to drive down I-55 and cross the Des Plaines River. <laughs> and you look out and you can squint a little bit and you can see what might be. It's not too hard to imagine the river valley being a place where humans and nature interact in a happier and healthier way than we currently do. But that's not exactly what's there. It's, maybe it's a little bit of a wildlife corridor compared to the rest of Illinois. Maybe it's a slight place of recreation. But largely, the vistas are different. You see barges. You see the, jolt, you see the Exxon refinery in the background. This is what's along the river. And this is what the river is used for. And these are the industries and these are the economic interests that control the use of the river by and large. So I love to drive by it, I, you know, probably for the same reason that people are watching the squid game. Dystopia is compelling. The apocalypse is beautiful. So this is the area. This is Brandon Road. It's a sacrifice zone. We've ceded use and control of our great rivers to polluting, climate-wrecking industries. And for over a century, we've sent our waste downstream. Chicago has made its waste problem Joliet's problem. Sewage, industrial waste, back in the day, rotting hog carcasses. It all went downstream and went somewhere else. Joliet, Peoria, St. Louis, Memphis, New Orleans, eventually the Gulf. This sacrifice zone means that these areas are degraded. Our rivers have been so mismanaged, manhandled, polluted, and degraded. Who is left to speak for them? What constituency is there for the rivers? By and large, the constituency there is, is these polluting industries, the very people abusing the rivers. Now, that's a dramatic difference from the Great Lakes. Now, the lakes aren't perfect. They're not pristine. You can read about what's happening in the south you know, part of Lake Michigan. Nevertheless, there are stakeholders who are looking out for the Great Lakes. Stakeholders with money, other industries who do depend on ecologically healthy lakes. And those stakeholders have money to spend and to advocate and lobby and to fund nonprofits. Many of them have nice houses on the lake shores. And they want to protect those interests. And I understand that. The Great Lakes are considered crown jewels of the region. Are our rivers? I would say no. I don't believe they're considered as such because we've spent a century plus degrading them. Rivers are more than water flows. Rivers, along with the floodplains that they should be connected to, are communities of life. But we've turned them into open sewers and channelized barge highways. So why are we putting this here? Why are environmentalists and environmental groups advocating for this solution in this location? Because for all the lofty rhetoric about protecting places, protecting communities, we are doubling down on the paradigm of the sacrifice zone. The rivers can be sacrificed for the sake of the Great Lakes. At the end of the day, that's my issue with Brandon Road. It's not really an invasive species solution. We saw the invasive species that it's not going to stop. It's not even really the best carp solution. 
Close the lock if you want to stop the car. Do it tomorrow. Is the solution designed to accommodate the status quo while achieving at unbelievably high cost some difficult to quantify amount of risk reduction against invasive carp? Now, that status quo is obviously valuable to a lot of people. You may weigh all of that against the cost of letting carp into the Great Lakes, and it still looks good by comparison. I totally understand that. I don't blame anyone who comes to that conclusion, but I would again point out it's not a binary of choosing Brandon Road or nothing. There were other options. Closing the lock was one, cheaper, more effective one if you only want to stop the carp. Restoring the natural divide was another. But either of those solutions require fundamental shifts in the way we do business. Chicago puts its, its waste into the river because it can't meet the standard to put, the, to put that waste into the lake. It's cheaper. It doesn't have to pay it upgrade. It's the only city sending its waste away from the Great Lakes. It's the only city that, along the Great Lakes that uses the Great Lakes water that doesn't put, clean it up and put it back in. It sends it away. And closing the lock would mean the end of shipping Petco petroleum products, chemicals on the, on the river. This is a story that implicates much of the way we do business. The economy, government, but I think the, the thread that runs through it that is important to me to convey is that this is a story of sacrifice zones, of forcing other people to pay the costs. It's a story of capital, it's a story of private property taking precedence over the public interest. My problem is that the first chance of gaining some security for what is considered to be our corner of the world at the expense of someone else, that was jumped at. Oh, I just want to point this out. I just came across this photo as I was doing the research. It's just a story from 2019. Fire smoke from the Juliet refinery there along I-55. Nothing to worry about. Yeah. Normal part of operations. I believe that part. Normal part of operations. I, I'm skeptical about the, nothing to worry about. So there you go. There's another view of the Des Plaines. This is what the river is for. Here's the Chicago River. This was rust and dirt from a couple years ago. It's not sewage. But I would just say, imagine, it could be anything. It could be any pollutant. Rust, dirt, sewage, industrial waste. This is going into the river, and it's going downstream. And we allow it to continue to happen. The dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico is caused by nutrient pollution, nitrogen, and phosphorus. The green represents agricultural runoff, by and large, the biggest contributor to the dead zone. But the red is urban runoff. You'll notice that Chicago is the single biggest contributor to the Gulf dead zone. And that's all carried through the cause and into the Mississippi River. And then finally, whoop. oh, sorry, pointing the wrong way. Um, I just want to say that it's important to realize this is a system. It's a system that stretches from the Atlantic Ocean to Chicago via the Great Lakes and then through the cause to the Gulf. And the last thing I'll say, you know, rivers should be multi-dimensional assets for communities, not just shipping lanes. Shipping can play a role. Industry can play a role, but they need to play along with other partners, including nature itself. And in my experience as an advocate um, on this issue, I think, you know, I think there are a couple ways you can approach environmental advocacy. I think the default is you ask, well, how can we protect this place, this land, this water that we consider to be ours. This is all, we have jurisdiction over this. How do we protect this place? And that's fine, that's a good question to ask. I would challenge other environmental funders, organizations, and activists doing this work to ask another question. Are we doing harm to someone else? And if so, should we remedy that? Thank you. Thank you so much, Robert. That was uh, amazing. I have so many questions, but <laughs> maybe we can do that in the Q&A. Um, so uh, I'm going to start introducing uh, the project of Sarah Lewison and I. 
I want to first thank also the Chicago Humanities Festival as well as Freshwater Lab at UIC and Rachel for inviting us to this uh, panel today. And um, our project that Sarah and I have been uh, undertaking since 2018 or so is actually called uh, Reshaping the Shape, the Embodiment, Ecology, and Culture of a Post-Natural Fish. And this project's been supported by an uh, invitation that was made by the House of World Cultures in Berlin, Germany, that was sponsoring a, a whole series of projects over the course of the year on the Mississippi River. And part of the Art and Ecology Collective that us, uh, Sarah and I are part of, Deep Time Chicago, um, basically had a project that was near the confluence. And so our project is just a sub-project of, of yet another series of projects around the Mississippi. But as you can see in this sort of classic picture, right, of, of the Asian carp, which are in fact four different species, but usually we think of the silver and the big head, this is on the Fox River, we see the abundance of this fish, right? But for us, this abundance is, of course, uh, we see it as a problem. And by the we, I, I, I guess that's a good question, who, who is exactly that we? We want to try to change that perspective on whether this is a problem. But we think of this as an invasive species because of the fact that its abundance uh, doesn't belong here, right? It's somehow intruding on the way that we think about uh, this particular ecosystem. And so, let's see. What's that? Oh, please, yeah. Thanks, Sarah. And so in this image, if you were to, for example, Google image search the word invasive species, uh, you get a bunch of these uh, appearing. And of course, it's not just carp, but we have um, zebra mussels and lionfish and spotted lanternfly. And these posters obviously are kind of a joke. And yet I think they say something um, that it's a little more serious about our attitudes towards what we consider non-native species, right? These species that are non-native, that are invasive, are, are outlaws, right, in sort of this Wild West sense. There's a, a, an expanse of opportunity, and yet they're still doing something that's outside the law of what's allowed. And so the question becomes, well, what law is that in sort of the law of nature, right? I suppose these fish are really guilty of being uh, particularly prodigious and abundant and reproductive, which would seem to be the very thing that um, is okay in nature. But here we have this sort of notion of the out of place. And that's, of course, a lot of what um, North American conservation ethic is built on, is this idea of conserving what was original, with, of course, the notion of the original being very highly contested. Um, so the pro project that Sarah and I have been undertaking is really to try to think through uh, this very complicated human river species complex, right? It's not just about, um, and so if we go to the next slide, you can see it's not just about one species or one place, it's about a, a number of entangled histories, a number of entangled um, approaches to uh, economy, ecology, and that's what this sort of diagram is meant to try to start to untangle and unpack. Um, and maybe Sarah, you can say more here. Uh, yeah, in the foreground, it's uh, out of focus, but you see a taxidermied carp that, wa that we obtained from a fish processor. She loves these fish so much, and we'll talk about her later. This fish was about three or four feet long, and it was a, uh, had a special color. It was kind of a mutant, she said. And that's in the foreground. And in the background is uh, this uh, chart that represents the entanglement that Andy started to talk about. I did want to go back for a second just to talk about how these are not the first carp that were brought to this continent. There have been generations of carp going brought back to this continent, uh, especially in the 1800s when uh, common carp were thrown off of railroad trestles into uh, streams and, uh, and, and started to populate the waterways. And this was because immigrants, uh, especially coming from Germany, wanted to bring their special fish with them that they loved. And, but this fish, and then the grass carp uh, preceded the, uh, these particular species, the big head and the silver. But these are especially dramatic uh, because they are, as Andy was saying, so robust. They were brought in, uh, it's unclear, there's a lot of stories, but it seems like 1970, 1971 or two, somewhere around there, just around the same time as the Clean Water Act was established. They were purchased from a fish farm in Taiwan. They were brought to Arkansas for the purpose of, um, yes, uh, filtering, cleaning out the algae and phytoplanktons in aquaculture ponds. And it was also understood as an experiment at the time. And the Arkansas Fish and Wildlife uh, 
department actually uh, asked the fish farmer who brought who imported them to uh, to take custody uh, because at, at, a, at their station because they were going to uh, study uh, study w what could possibly happen if they did escape into the uh, waterways. But what did happen is they, of course, did. Um, but another interesting backstory is that uh, the this impulse was a good one. Rachel Carson's Silent Spring had only had come out within the past 10 years, and biologists, fish farmers, and wildlife managers were looking for ways to use biological controls instead of herbicides, uh, because these fish can eat tons of phytoplankton, plankton, it saved putting tons and tons of herbicides into the waterways. Um, my theory about the escape is uh, that I've, I've learned that the fish tend to produce eggs on a, a rising tide. And uh, my theory, it, this is where the speculation, and which is part of our work, starts to play in. I, I feel like these fish, which were effectively janitors, threw their eggs over the barriers. Do you want to talk about the diagram a little more and move on? Uh, no, I mean, I think some of this is touched on. I think the other thing to say that um, you can point out is we're highlighting some of the things that already Robert's mentioned about this complex relationship of the river and how its various inputs, of course, the waste from Chicago, but also the nitrogen runoff from farming and uh, the global entanglement of this, not just in the history of the fish originally coming from Asia, but now the fish also in many cases, as we'll talk about, getting shipped back. Nice. So, um can you, uh, oh great, you did already. So our part of our research process, we, we became obsessed with them and uh, well, at first we went with a team of other researchers and artists from Deep Time Chicago and we explored around the confluence and around uh, especially this uh, rakes and, lakes and rivers system that had been highly altered in Kentucky and uh, we saw. We went to the Barkley Dam, and we saw carcasses. These huge carcasses of these fish, and we wondered why. What was wrong with this fish? Like people were fishing, but they would throw this one out. Why was it so reviled? Could it be the name? Should we call them by another name? Are they good to eat? Are they bad to eat? We were really curious, and we started to uh, look around to see who's processing these fish, and um, who's working with them. And so we found two processors in this uh, general region, the confluence uh, where the Mississippi and the Ohio River come together. And one of them was uh, Angie Yu, uh, who was a um, kind of an international uh, ex importer exporter uh, for years who got into fisheries. And at the time we met her, she was in the process of, she has a huge business. She's running uh, five to 10 or more tons of fish through her, her factory a day. Um, and uh, she's, uh, with, the, with the help, there's a bit of intrigue here that we're unsure of, it, but it seems like with the help of, of federal subsidies, that have been siphoned to her project. Uh, she's through a, a kind of thrown up nonprofit. Uh, she's uh, been opening an international fisheries park, which would, would be this huge piece of rural land that will be taken over for a fisheries industry that would be highly populated by, like, that they would actually, uh, the way she described it to us the first time, what sounded bizarre, but a Chinese village of restaurants that all served fish dishes. <laughs> that would be uh, subsidized and funneled through Mitch McConnell's uh, pork belly largesse. Because here, of course, the context is at the confluence just on the other side of the Ohio is Kentucky. And so uh, we were also talking to people um, in Kentucky, uh, wildlife managers and, and others there. And, and some of the concerns on the Ohio uh, or Lake Barkley or others also have to do not just with the fish in terms of not, in that case, is in the evasion of the Great Lakes. It's the threat that jumping fish and otherwise like pose to tourism and boating. And so that's an, another interesting layer is like the different parts of the river, of course, uh, the, there are different sets of concerns at play. Yeah, exactly. And Angie Yu's model, business model, was, is very much the, 
uh, antithesis of a bioregional model, which is what we were curious about. She was freezing the fish, cutting them in half, and then shipping them back to diasporic Chinese communities all over the world. In Paris, in every city where there's a Chinatown, they received her fish. So we, and then um, by luck, we got to meet um, the this, the antimony, the, you know, the total opposite business model, which is being run by Lu 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 and John Crilly. They had a small factory, they still have it, called Finn Gourmet in Paducah, Kentucky. Kentucky. They process about two or three tons of fish a day. They buy the catch of fishers from Kentucky all the way down to Louisiana and establish familial relations with these fishers. They hand process the fish in a small factory. Um, hiring, often hiring people who would otherwise have a difficult time finding jobs um, and, 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 and work closely with them to build job skills. Um, besides the hand cut fillets, which they sell under the name of Silverfin and have been doing so for several years, Lula is a skilled Vietnamese chef and she's created an array of packaged products including freshwater fish cake, which is also called surimi, uh, barbecue strips, and then they also produce delicacies for, delicacies for dogs and are working towards actually using the entire fish in different products, including compost. They take a bioregional approach which lines up with what we thought about addressing the fish as something that now belongs to this place and that is now part, part of the ecology of the region and um, kind of raising the um, idea that what needs to start to change is our attitude toward them. Mm. And then the next slide. Right, and so um, before I talk about this particular slide that gets into some of the um, different shapes our project took, right, uh, in all of this then, uh, our interest in, of course, looking at fish processors, people who are trying to use the, the fish as food, um, is getting to the point of what Robert was raising uh, earlier in terms of like this attitude of waste culture. We live in a culture of waste and sort of like barriers and of right things that do belong and don't belong. And one thing that Sarah and I found is so disturbing was the extent to which Asian carp, um, the whole attitude toward them was basically right uh, confrontational and also wasteful. A lot of times, you know, the Illinois Department of Natural Resources hires fish people to c collect fish from the river uh, lower down. And, and often though, at least historically, a lot of that fish was just being thrown into landfills. It was a huge waste of resources. It was this idea that if you don't belong, then you're basic, it, it, this is trash. And it, this is just completely not an ecological mindset. And so for us, the idea was like, how can this fish that of course is not ever gonna be eradicated from the watershed be incorporated into our ecology and in our culture in a way that's productive, that isn't about waste, but it's about resource, right? Because in the ecological mindset, everything that's sort of waste to something else is a resource to another. But that's not the sort of culture we live in currently. And so we were very engaged with this question of people using the fish as food, but then furthermore, really engaged with the idea of Fin Gourmet making this a bioregional approach, not replicating the idea of then shipping this unwanted fish somewhere else where it's wanted, but tr to try to incorporate it into uh, what we see as the culture of the Midwest. And so part of that campaign was, of course, trying to raise a, a series of different prompts and provocations around the idea of um, this fish being foreign. So as Sarah had mentioned, the European carp, or what's now called the common carp, used to be called the European or German carp, and it was brought in the 1880s by German immigrants to the Midwest. Now, now the German carp is called the common carp. <laughs> uh, so my question, and I'm, uh, is when will the Asian carp become an American carp? Because it's also n not going anywhere, and of course, just to give some context, we're starting this project in 2018, in the middle of the Trump administration, uh, when all of these questions around, right, uh, immigration or nativeness or foreignness uh, were really at play. And of course, COVID has only borne that out further. Uh, myself as an Asian American, and my parent who's an immigrant from Asia, uh, this whole idea of the Asian carp as invasive also set, sets up a whole other set of metaphors and cultural predilections. And part of then trying to have a campaign of creating this fish as part of our ecology isn't just about how it's eaten or taken as a resource, it's how it's perceived and understood, right, in this sort of symbolic semiotic and linguistic way. So this billboard in Cairo, Illinois, is trying to posit a way to rethink and reframe the way to reshape the shape of our thinking around this fish.
And then this kind of, this other one um, <laughs> in Southern Illinois continues that. Here we have, of course, Asian carp Midwest superfood. In the red, we have Asian and we have Midwest. So trying to put in relation what these two things mean, and then carp and superfood in relation to each other as well, to try to, again, try to recalibrate or reassociate, um, in this case, not just meanings of geography and culture, but then also the other significant part of this, which is, of course, the idea of the carp as a resource. And, um, and, you know, and then in terms of the message, uh, Lula and John at Finn Gourmet also talk about what they believe are the healing qualities of the fish. It has as much omega-3 as salmon and as much protein as buffalo fish, which is a, a native species which apparently is fabled for having a high protein content. And this, uh, as a filter feeder, it does not concentrate heavy metals because it stays near the top. It's kind of an ideal food, and there's so much of it. Um, so, and also the superfood is, is kind of a food fad. Um, and, you know, it has been lately where, uh, uh, you know, there's finally been some kind of public critical consciousness of foods that don't give uh, nutritional value, but very often these superfoods are, are imported from very, very far away and highly processed. So we wanted also to draw in that association with uh, something that's accessible, that's local, that's regional, that's clean, that's wild caught, actually available, could be available if the markets could change, would be here for you. It's not a glamorous food, it's a food for the people that you could eat instead of steak. Oh yeah, so healing. So what does it mean to, there's different ways of seeing a river. We could see a river as a highway, as an economic infrastructure. We could see it as an aesthetic object in the distance and we could have a river walk and walk alongside it and have it lap, you know, lap against the wall. Um, we can see it as a conveyance and take a boat. But it's, you know, what does it mean to understand a river? It's not just the banks or the species that live within it. It's all, not, it is the species, and it's all the modalities and the, all of the, uh, the texture of its walls and how deep is its bottom and how much is it silt and how, and how many different species are allowed to live there. Um, and all of those uh, factors take, uh, play a part in re-establishing or developing or imagining another kind of relations that humans can have with it. And another one is to harvest from it. And this is something that unless you live in a rural place, you come from a family that fishes, we're so unfamiliar with. But historically, every human culture that was, that, that was established around waterways and around coasts was created from the advantage of this diverse kind of, of, of protein, of this diverse kind of animal life that could feed humans. So we wanted to, um, you know, there's this bioregional movement which, where people actually, it was a, uh, started in the 70s, where people really started to map out regions and their watersheds in particular and really think about what used to be here and what is here now. Um, and it was a process, a kind of thinking process for a group of people to start to imagine plan planning from below and reimagine where they live in order to create new, um, like to reestablish relationships that have been severed. Uh, and they've been severed by this uh, thing called, you know, now it's called, um, what is it called? The supply chain, right? Mm -hmm. Like by this idea that it was no problem, that it was an easy thing, that it was totally um, a, a, a simple thing to get anything you needed anytime you wanted from anywhere around the globe. But, and, you know, and right now people are suffering because of that because they can't have their, their, their instant gratification, but I think there's a deeper and mo more profound lesson to be uh, attained from this, which is, you know, well, what could you do here? And so just with this then, I also want to say uh, the idea of healing the river, we of course recognize the issues, ecological issues around the abundance of the carp. The, you know, you can create barriers all you want, but if you want to draw down carp populations and some of these risks that Robert's been articulating, then, you know, make a market for this carp, eat the carp, heal the river by decreasing its numbers uh, through um, this eating, right? So we also want to recognize that eat the river seems a little strange, but in fact, 
you know, the river isn't just a body of water, it's a body of life, and the body of the fish is itself part of the river. And so to really sort of acknowledge that the river isn't just water, it's all of its components and it's all the ways in which it's interacted with. Yeah, that's great. That's really great. And so we um, embarked upon that. Um, since we were well supported by the House of World Cultures and we had so many great comrades from Deep Time Chicago and from up and down the river to participate in this project with us, we were able to get pounds and pounds of fish. And in um, south of Carbondale in the Shawnee National Forest, uh, there was going to be, uh, in 19, 2019, in the fall, activists planned uh, what they called the resurgence, the North American Forest and Climate Convergence. It was uh, a, a way, a, a, it, it, the, the idea was to bring together activists, indigenous activists, and activists working in forests, and more activists working against pipelines, together in one huge three or four-day meeting in the forest to recharge, to share ideas, to uh, kind of think about strategies together going forward. And we uh, joined the convergence by uh, bringing them carp and created a, this huge uh, carp taco dinner for everyone as a way to, like, again, rethink about this, uh, think again about this con reconnection. And so, you know, part of this is not just, you know, people talk about having a media ecology, but we also wanted to create ecology media. We wanted to put out, uh, as where, wherever we could, information about this fish. And, you know, of course, behavioral economists talk about nudging people or populations um, by, you know, sort of almost microdosing them with different kinds of uh, imagery or text. And this is in part really what we are trying to do. So these placemats that were, um, at this dinner and others that we have held are sort of bringing across some of this, these informations, not just about flows and loops, which is about the facts of the river, its nutrition, the fact that our Chicago waste helps the algae that the fish you know, uh, rely upon. And then this, of course, these ideas about what it means to be native or immigrant or invasive and, and throwing those into question. And of course, though, highlighting tasty, wild, sustainable, local, healthy, silvery, nutritious, and abundant. And it's fun, you know, one of the dreams for me doing ecological art is to think about how do we get into a curricula. And placemats are, are kind of like that. They're like <laughs> little lessons. So, yeah. Talk. Now here um, we also uh, took up some kite making workshops in Carbondale, and this is at Carbondale Community Arts Center. Um, the fish is, uh, these kites are kind of mim mimicking uh, koi nobori, which is a Japanese uh, kite that's a, a carp streamer that's used on Children's Day in Japan because of the fact that in the Asian culture, the carp is a sign of luck and vitality and prosperity. And so again, trying to think about other cultural ways to reframe our understanding of this fish by having these workshops where people could make streamers, but also that we could talk about the carp to people who came, right? To have it be a sort of learning and listening session around the carp and making these kites in preparation for this event, which is? Oh, well, that was a parade that happens in Carbondale every year, organized by the beloved Puppetista group. It's an all-species puppet parade. Uh, so the carp came to the parade, and we're going to um, move to the next slide. And, uh, yeah, here's after the, on, on Earth Day when people are gathering together. And here, even, there's kind of an interesting, very quick side story. The all-species parade, oh. um, right, is about sort of like, usually highlighting monarch butterflies and cheetahs and other endangered species. So when we approached them asking if the Asian carp could be part of the parade, that created a really interesting conversation around whether that was appropriate or not, because in fact, isn't this the fish that's in threatening our other native species? But if it's an all species parade, then why shouldn't the Asian carp be included? Um, and they said, yes, actually, you know, that makes a lot of sense. And so again, this conversation isn't just with the public, with someone driving in their pickup along the street. It's not just with forest activists, it's with puppeteers, it's just everyone having to sort of reframe and reshape the shape of their thinking around this fish. And um, so this is the installation we made in, you can see those big fish a little bit better, in uh, Carbondale in the museum there. And uh, you know, the idea was to have religious over, overtones, like uh, you know, to, to start to think how uh, you know, not to appropriate, not to appropriate 
indigenous law or indigenous thought, but to develop our own reverence for what supports us and sustains us because it's a, because it establishes relationships and relationships are actually debts in which we, through our, re, our repayment are forms of care. And um, you know, a reverence for food because it is so close for us, close to us. Yeah, so contrast the first image we showed of the fish jumping out of the Fox River in that abundance with something that actually mimics this but tries to draw out a different sense of that, right? The fact that we would intentionally um, stream and put out these fish and this imagery as a way to think about its abundance in a different kind of way, right? Um, which also, if you're interested right now at Co-Prosperity in Bridgewater or at Art, um, Watershed Art and Ecology here in Chicago, um, part of the Deep Time project is uh, on display, including uh, the, this uh, Reshaping the Shape project. But these are some books that, um, uh, uh, titles of books that Sarah and I have think should be in circulation, but have yet to be written. Because then the question is speculatively, where, where is our culture of, uh, of carp and ecology of carp going? We kind of imagine a world in which carp is such an intriguing uh, topic that there's all kinds of trade books um, <laughs> for the casual reader and the expert alike, globalizing carp, a planetary Wait, fishery. Andy, maybe, um I, maybe while this is here, well, we have just a few minutes together. Yeah, maybe instead of giving other people, yeah, yeah, you know, we've got three of the leading yeah. speakers here. So just, um, first of all, thank you so much for a great presentation. <laughs> and I just don't want to lose this moment of yeah. being present with the three of you. So with our remaining time, my questions, what I want to open up for discussion are basically two two categories, and I'll throw them out now, and you can each meditate on which part you like before we um, meet everybody out in the lobby for more informal discussions. So th this came up quite a bit, but I want to get right to the heart of the matter with language. What, what do we get by naming these fish Asian? I once had an attorney in Detroit say to me, nobody wanted to do anything about these fish. And then the minute that that moniker came, it sort of reminded people in the Rust Belt about Asian automobiles and evoked this whole sense of invasion and panic. So along with that word of naming them Asian carp, I want to get a little deeper into the language of native and invasive. And I want to ask, you know, first of all, when we name these species invaders, who does that indicate as being the natives, right? I don't think that it points towards indigenous peoples. So, like, what degree does naming species exotic or invasive sort of set up whiteness as a kind of nativeness in North America? And the other question I, I'd like to get at with this language is to what degree, and I loved your wanted posters, to what degree does the panic about the species actually divert our view from things like commodity chains or the way that rivers have been turned into pipelines and shipping channels? So how does like focusing on the species actually occlude our view of the kind of things that you brought up, Robert, of seeing those shipping channels. So I want to put all that out there about language, and I'll just ask my second question now, because time might not be on our side. I, I want to point towards our end together, towards next month's event on speculative infrastructure. And you're all such creative thinkers that I, I'd like to kind of invite your speculation of where this could go and take a little moment to share with everyone here something exciting that the Freshwater Lab has going, where we're starting the beginning um, research about thinking about recycling the water that we're now currently diverting to the Gulf of Mexico that's, feuding, that's fueling this dead zone. So like that's our own speculation, like stop treating water like waste, treat it like the life that it is. So that's my speculative vision, but I'd, I'd like to hear, yeah, your thoughts on this native, invasive, Asian, the whole language piece, and then take us out with a little bit of a view towards the possible. And we can just, uh, Robert, maybe we'll hear from you and then we'll wind it up down the line. Sure. 
So, on the language front, I mean, I, you know, I'd be speculating here too. I, you know, but I'll just wade right into being problematic. Humans are the invasive species. Now, not all of us, not all humans, but I mean, when we talk about where these species are, or where they've come from, or where they're going, they're, it's because of how humans have moved, or how human commerce has moved. Ships, trains, boats, planes, whatever. Like, it's a function of our movement. So, you know, that's number one. Um, I certainly think that it has, um, there are connotations of foreignness, and there's no doubt that that ha has played a role. And there's precedent for that um, with other invasive species as well, you know, Eurasian milfoil or, or whatever. It's just there, there's an otherness there um, that intentional or not, you know, I, I, it's, I'm not sure, but it, in effect, it works that way. Um, but it is interesting to me, even going back to the slide where it's, well, why these fish? Why not other ones? We, you know, some invasive species we care about and some we don't. Um, and certainly part of protecting the Great Lakes from invasive carp, there are non-native species in there. There are fisheries for non-native species. Could there be a fishery for carp? Is there a whole opportunity to make that a new industry? Maybe, I don't know, but um, there's a lot of there's a lot of just sunk cost-ism, you know? This is the way we've done things, we're gonna continue to do things. Well, again, we've now built up constituencies and industries and economic bases around what's here now, and so any threat to that disruption um, makes people um, nervous. Um, I'll, I'll leave it there. Well, I'll just say the idea of the foreignness, I'm so glad you brought this up, Rachel, is, is about sort of um, you know, creating this occlusion or externality, right, that tries to draw attention away from the other things. I mean, people often, of course, uh, claim that invasive species are a cause of, of ecological disruption, but, you know, they're just as much a symptom of ecological disruption, really not a cause. And the question then becomes, right, in that, how do we then um, reshape all of these things? How do we point more directly towards uh, things in the system that really are responsible for the degradation of the environment, rather than, in a sense, scapegoating these quote-unquote outlaws uh, that are a much easier target, you know? And I think there's plenty of analogies to be drawn in that case, again, <laughs> towards the way uh, um, sometimes certain groups of, you know, quote-unquote Native Amer uh, Americans think about like, foreigners or immigrants otherwise, right, that are also scapegoated um, in terms of, like, what they're doing to disrupt. So your mention of, the, of course, the, um, the, uh, the auto industry and other things like this. Historically, um, I, I think it's, not, it's more than a metaphor and it's more than an analogy. I think it's part of the way that we culturally understand and process information that, that does need to be reframed. Okay, Sarah, you're gonna take us out. I don't, <laughs> having a hard time knowing if I can add to that because you guys said so much, but um, I mean, the militarism that's inherent in the um, the, this kind of naming, um, it just makes me like, you know, Andy, you talk about externalities and I was thinking, it's like the name is, is attached to the continent, it's attached to a geography, and then it becomes attached to an attribution that is given to a human who has, a, there, for, a, around whom there's a perception of, of some kind of attributions that, that, that have been like kind of like a whole bunch of political garbage has been thrown at them whether or not they deserve that. Like so bad debt, oh bad debt with China, oh then we'll just throw it on that individual and attack them. And, and it's so, it's, it's, it's an incredibly, um, it's an incredible big mess of, um, I don't know what, of thinking of, 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 I think it again has to do with distance of not having um, an actual understanding of much of what goes on in um, like, you know, externalities are called externalities because they're kept out of sight. So, um, and, and uh, maybe we need new words. Maybe, um, maybe we should call them uh, bad fish and make bad fish a good thing and have local fish markets on every street that sell bad fish. And in other words, become more playful with language and uh, start to uh, pull it away from these um, so, such malevolent, such ma malevolent and, hate, and hateful kinds of, 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 of patterns uh, that are reproduced over and over again.
Well, that's a perfect place to end. Please join me in thanking the panelists. Thank <laughs> you.